Imagine turning on a light in a room. For those that are close to it, it appears dim and barely visible. But for those that are further away, it appears brighter than the sun. The further away they then move, the brighter and brighter it becomes. Now our understanding of the world is that this isn't how it behaves. With distance, lights get dimmer and sounds get quieter. The pull of Earth's gravity on us is stronger than the pull of the sun's, even though the sun has more mass. And that is because distance, yes, makes the heart grow fonder, but it makes the force grow weaker. That is all except for one, the strong force, where the more distant its action becomes, the stronger that force acts, like nothing else that we know of. It also accounts for around 99% of the mass of the visible universe, the remaining 1% coming from the Higgs boson. But despite it binding everything in our universe together, it has been at the edges of our understanding for a very long time because of just how strange it really is. The story that I want to tell today is that of the work done by several brilliant teams of physicists over many years that helped us to uncover as much as we now know about the strongest but most mysterious force in our entire universe. Before I go any further, full apologies, I will be joined this week by a gentle, last measuring 101 degree temperature and a huskier, more nasal overtone. I'm sitting back from my usual purchase point for your safety in case this is a computer virus, but let's start with the easy stuff. How everything in the universe works. Before I get there, I have to keep you even safer and do a quick message from today's sponsor, ESET. For over three decades, ESET has empowered users to safely leverage the power of the internet for personal use and business growth. Their prevention-first approach combines the power of AI trained on massive datasets they've collected over decades and industry-acclaimed human expertise from across their global network of research development centers. That helps you keep up to date to constantly provide valuable threat intelligence to keep you always one step ahead of known and emerging cyber threats. Their ESET home products bring comprehensive personal protection to you and your family members, guaranteed to keep you safe from YouTubers with colds, and their award-winning business offering, ESET Protect, provides organizations with exceptional protection in the form of a highly customizable cloud-first cybersecurity platform. ESET are awesome champions of science, education, and progressive technologies, and support causes that drive the world towards a better future. They are a key partner of Starmus Earth, a festival of art and science that discuss the future of our home planet. In their hometown, Bratislava, on May 12th to 17th this year, Year. If you'd like to check out ESET, I'll leave a link down in the description to find out more. Stay safe on the internet. Let's get into the video. The Greek philosopher Democritus was the first to propose the existence of atoms, taken from the term atomon, meaning indivisible. He said, in reality, there's only atoms and the void, which sounds like a lyric from an angsty teenage physics band, which I'm always surprised there aren't actually more of. But unfortunately for Democritus, despite the universe creating atoms, the universe also created particle physicists, who took to learning about the universe in a way analogous to learning how a watch works by first throwing it against the wall and then studying the pieces. In smashing apart atoms, out popped protons and neutrons. Then from further smashing, out popped quarks, the building blocks of matter. The strong force connects all of these components together, binding quarks together into protons and neutrons, and then binding protons and neutrons together to form nuclei. We have a very refined understanding of the other three forces that we have in our universe, the electromagnetic force, the force of gravity, and the weak force. The way we talk about how these forces work is by their coupling constant that set the strength and interaction characteristics of each force. The coupling constant for the electromagnetic force, for example, is the fine structure constant alpha, which has a value of approximately this, which is slightly easier to remember as 1 over 137. And yes, that does sound suspiciously specific, but we have measured the electromagnetic force's coupling constant to incredible levels of accuracy, equivalent to measuring the distance between New York and LA to within the width of a few human hairs. The strong force's coupling constant is called alpha s, and our estimates for it aren't quite as precise. As far as we can work out, it's somewhere between zero and infinity 
which is embarrassing because that's basically as big of a range as you can get, but at least it's not as big as infinity plus one. That lack of clarity comes from how the strong force works. Let's take the electromagnetic force as a comparison. When moving some positively or negatively charged particles up and down, say on an antenna, this causes an electromagnetic wave to move away from the particles. This disturbance or electromagnetic force is carried by photons. These photons move at the speed of light and don't have any inherent charge or mass or anything else complicated to deal with. As a result, they don't interact with other photons, but if they get close to some other positively or negatively charged particles, they will couple to them and transmit that energy that they carry into some movement in the charged particles. If we think about the interaction between two quarks, the strong force between them is carried by a gluon. The strong force works on a different type of charge to the electromagnetic force. We call it color rather than charge to distinguish it from the electromagnetic charge, and rather than just positive or negative, it comes in three states. So we call these red, green, and blue. And each of these, rather than positive attracting negative like in electromagnetism, the strong force is trying to produce either white or black either by adding red, green, and blue together to produce white, or by adding a color and its anti-color together to cancel out and produce black. Gluons, the particle that carries this force, works to mediate across all of these different colors, creating groups of three quarks, baryons, or groups of two, mesons. This process is complicated enough to take a while to get your head around, let alone come up with a comfortable understanding of why the strange behavior is observed, but it gets weirder. The truly complexity-inducing and confusing part is that gluons also have their own color charge, and so can interact with other gluons specifically those popping in and out of existence constantly in the sea of virtual particles that exist at the quantum level. This carrier-to-carrier -carrier interaction creates a mess that was difficult to unpick exactly, and it creates what I think is the most interesting behavior for the strong force, which is with increasing distance, you get a stronger and stronger force applied. Now here I'm gonna slightly lazily conflate a couple of ideas for simplicity. For most forces we are comfortable with, we see the force drop as a function of distance. For the force between two charged particles with charges Q1 and Q2, this force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two objects. The greater the distance, the weaker the force. If you're a physicist and you look very, very closely here, you'll also notice that the constant that we add isn't actually constant, because nothing in particle physics chooses to be that simple. For most of the forces, the coupling constant isn't actually constant at all, but actually also changes slowly with distance. The electromagnetic constant decreases by 10% at very far distances. The strong force, we've said already, doesn't do this. The strong coupling constant, according to the initial workings of quantum chromodynamics, or QCD, our best model of how the strong force works, found that the coupling constant should increase with distance. When close together, there is almost no force between the quarks, but when the quarks are pulled apart, the energy required to separate them increases until they're essentially impossible to move further away. This is called asymptotic freedom, and it was the subject of the Nobel Physics Prize in 2004, where we find that around one third of the diameter of a proton, the strength of the coupling constant rapidly goes from zero to infinity. This is referred to as the Landau pole, after physicist Lev Landau. But the thing is, there's an inherent problem with this idea. Mathematicians can get away with infinities in their work, but where we, as physicists, find infinities in our models of nature, this is usually where our maths has gone slightly wrong. If that is the case, what other tricks does the strong force still have to tell us about the workings of the universe? There is a great disturbance in the force. The first clue came in the late 1990s at a particle accelerator at the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. A PhD student by the name of Alexander Dewar was collecting data on the strong force over short distance interactions. He did this by bombarding atoms with electrons to create scattering events between the quarks inside those subatomic particles, and then looking at the energies of the system after the collision. The results that he collected 
immediately puzzled him. Dewar expected to see results that followed the generally understood behavior of the strong force coupling constant, that over the distance of one third of a proton diameter, it climbs rapidly from zero to infinity. But rather than that rapid escalation to infinity, Dewar found instead a plateau. According to the theory, this data doesn't make sense, it's impossible. However, as Dewar started to dig around for an answer, he found that this result wasn't totally uncommon. Other scientific literature contained hints of the coupling interaction becoming constant at long distances, but generally it was brushed off as a mistake, a quirk of an experimental approach, or an area where the experimental method just broke down and some other effect was responsible. Dewar had an option here. Take a similar route, assume that maybe there was a flaw in his approach, and file it as something to come back to in the future. Or try and dig even deeper. Despite the potential reputational risk of saying something totally counter to the common belief in the field, Dewar chose to travel and present his findings to anyone that would listen, at departmental talks, in collaborations, and at conferences. And now as a positive note here, I don't find any evidence of him being laughed out of the room at any point, but rather his findings were generally met with a sense of kind of neutral, huh, that's interesting, but unless he could present a suggestion as to what might be happening, the probable likelihood was that this was just bad data. This was until he met Stanley Brodsky, a theoretical physicist and current emeritus professor at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, who helped Dewar apply a theoretical framework around his data. Brodsky had long been working on theoretical models to calculate QCD at long distances with a technique called light front holography that allows the calculation of parameters like coupling constant by treating our four dimensional universe as a five dimensional universe, where the fifth dimension effectively captures the strong interaction between quarks and gluons. Now I'm not going to go into the details, mostly because I have a fever and I also don't feel qualified to explain them with any level of clarity that is needed, but all that to say, although this sounds like making the maths more complicated, it actually simplifies it and lets many of the effects that lead to runaway infinities actually cancel out. Independently to what the data was telling them, Brodsky and his collaborators performed a set of calculations of the strong force coupling constant using their approach, and they found this result a largely perfect match to the dataset that Dewar had captured, by this point a decade earlier in his journey. To Brodsky, this wasn't necessarily a surprise. His belief was that the strong force should be confined. Thinking back to our thought experiment of pulling two quarks apart, although our initial model might have said that this requires infinite energy, as the strong force is desperately trying to resist because it wants things to conserve colour, either black or white, in reality, at some point, there is so much energy put into separating the quarks that it becomes energetically favourable for this energy to capture some of the quark anti-quark pairs constantly popping into and out of the vacuum, and tightly bonding them to the now separated quarks to maintain colour conservation. This effectively prevents any quarks from ever existing in isolation, but it also means that as you pull them apart, the strong force creates a chain reaction of particles popping into existence, ultimately limiting the practical reality of ever experiencing an infinite force. This gives a kind of physical understanding to a necessary limit in the strength of the strong force with greater and greater distance, and this may even, to some extent, set the perceived diameter of the proton. This means that quark and gluon quantum loops cannot grow larger than the size of a proton. Now the only downside to a holographic approach to solving this problem was that although holography was a good model of QCD, it didn't show teams working on QCD what they were actually doing wrong or how to correct their models, ultimately meaning that the result was interesting but not of immediate practical use in the modelling. It took a further decade to integrate the work within QCD to prove that the previously complex interactions between quarks and gluons that had made previous findings scale to infinity actually in fact do largely cancel out and become constant. Currently, the best QCD models map to Dewar's data to within a degree of 1% accuracy. Understanding how the strong coupling influences the binding energy that brings quarks together, but also binds protons and neutrons in the nucleus at the center of the atom, tells us about the formation of the smallest building blocks of the universe, but also influences the structure of the universe at its largest scales. 99% of the visible mass in our universe comes from atoms. 
As electrons are almost 2,000 times lighter than protons or neutrons, the nucleus of that atom contains the vast majority of this mass. These protons and neutrons are both made of quarks, but those independent quarks only make up about 1% of the constituent mass. The rest, 99%, Einstein's E equals mc squared tells us, comes from the energy contained in the bonds of the strong force, bonds that bind both quarks into nuclei and then those nuclei together to form a nucleus, a force so powerful it is capable of ripping particles straight from the void of the universe. Perhaps we were too quick to judge before. Maybe in reality, there is only atoms and the void. If you liked this episode, leave me a like and a comment down below. You might already know that the universe isn't real if you don't check it out here, but did you also know that Richard Feynman once got bested by a sprinkler? Check out those videos and today's sponsor, ESA, in the links down below. I am going for a lie down. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.